Hello and welcome back to the channel. So a few months ago I acquired this on eBay. This is the HC4500 from Sharp. It's a CE2 handheld PC with a really nice color screen. One minor issue, the previous owner of this had attempted to replace the batteries in the battery pack himself. The device otherwise works perfectly well when plugged in, however this is handheld computing not wall socket computing and we don't want to be tied to the socket. So I acquired another battery that's not been opened and was attached to an HC4600 which was sold as spares or repairs and the touchscreen on that currently doesn't work but we'll come to that another day. Today we're looking at trying to repair the battery pack. So before I get started I'd like to give a big shout out to the newest handheld computing member Tim Alston. Massive thanks for supporting the channel. I'd also like to let you know that I will be ditching my smartphone imminently. I have a Nokia 110 feature phone on order. It should arrive this week. I'm planning to do the videos on living with a dumb phone in 2024 as a live stream and then I'll pop them up on the channel after. This is mainly so that I don't actually have to do any editing. I know I'm so lazy but it does mean that it shouldn't interrupt my normal release schedule. The first video is currently planned and for the 4th of March and I'll pop some details on the community page. It would be nice to have a few of you join me and perhaps ask some questions during the stream. Failing that, I'll just talk to myself. So let's get started by having a look at the battery pack itself. So if we take a look at the battery, it's got a couple of contacts on this side and a couple on this side, although I think these two might just be one contact fed underneath that plastic ridge. We'll soon find out once we open it up. We can see the batteries through these little gaps at the bottom and it does look like that's the positive end and that's the negative. Looking on the side we've got a clear ridge down here running up past the contacts and then across through the back here. It feels like it might be glued and so I'm going to just heat it up a little bit and soften the glue. Because these are nickel metal hydride and not lithium iron I'm not too concerned about heating it as they're very unlikely to explode. I'm going to use a hairdryer rather than a heat gun because it's easier to manage the temperature and make sure we don't get things too hot. So let's see if that's worked. While doing this you do need to be careful not to damage the plastics as we do want to be able to put this all back together when we finish. And we're in. So you can see there's a bit of double sided tape there and otherwise yes it looks like they were glued or clipped together. As you can see these batteries have actually leaked. You don't want to be touching any of this so I'm just going to go and get some gloves. So unfortunately it looks like that last bit didn't actually record so I'm just going to show you how this was set up. First of all we've got the plus side here and we can see it was attached there to this ribbon cable. This is I assume a thermal fuse which is mentioned in the user manual and this was spot welded to the outside of this battery. The lead from this followed this piece of metal from there onto the positive terminal on the other battery and this appears to be an insulator so no power would run directly between the two batteries instead it would all go through this thermal fuse. At the other end we just had it spot welded to the negative terminal and as you can see the two ends just lead to these two contacts. So the circuit is like that. So now what I'm going to do is tidy all this up, clean out these battery compartments and then we're going to have a look at reconstructing it. So just before I continue I've unwrapped all the um, insulator material and you can see this is just two plates spot welded together. There's no components there. The only other thing that I am wondering about is this. You can see if we pop a light behind it that actually these two are not connected. It looks like they may have been or it might have been that this is the thermal resistor and any break in that stops it or perhaps I'm missing a component here. So 
we'll just have to see what happens. So now we've reconstructed the battery. It is missing a thermal fuse, but we've got all the connectors. So we know that this one just goes to the two pins there. This one appears to have two pins, but in the back of my palm top, I've only actually got one. So I am starting to think I'm missing a pin in the back of here. And this may be why I am struggling to get anything to work. But we're just gonna have a quick go at connecting everything up before we go attempting to rent the actual battery pack itself. So I've got a couple of double A's, some crocodile clips, and some neodymium magnets to connect things together and we'll give it a whirl. So first of all, let's connect these two together, like so. I use the markings I handily put on here earlier to make sure we get the batteries the right way around. So plus is this side, minus this side. So I'm gonna use this one as the plus. And we know from our contacts that the minus comes to the two pins at the other side. So we're gonna connect two leads to the rear. Connect one to the top and connect one to the bottom. Doesn't matter if they touch because they're both coming from the same place. So we'll just now check that we've actually got voltage to all of these. So this is the top pin, 2.7 volts nearly. Oh, let's check, that's the bottom pin, 2.7. I'll just double check the top, I'm not sure I was on the top or the bottom, 2.7. And we'll check the other end, make sure we've got power going in. Yep, 2.7, perfect. So we've got power going everywhere. But when I open this up, it won't turn on. I know what you're thinking, but I already set the switch to the correct position. So I'm just gonna try popping a backup battery in as well because some handheld PCs require the backup battery to be installed. And still no joy. The next thing of course is to plug the handheld in. So we'll just pop that in there. Got a bit of flashing. That's because it thinks it's been switched on already. So we're just gonna power it on. Give it a second, here we go. Lovely, sorry about the screen flicker. Let's just skip through this. And that looks good. Okay, so I can't get rid of the flicker, but I'm just gonna quickly show you if I go to settings and control panel, you'll see that it reports the battery is good and the backup battery is good. So at the moment, if I turn it off, we get the flash because it's uh, not wanting to charge it for some reason, but it's saving its position. If I turn it off and unplug it, we can't turn it on, but if I plug it back in, it saved its position. And finally, while it's connected like this, if I actually undo the battery, it does a soft reset. Like so. So there's clearly something registering the power from that battery going into the machine. As I say, I think I might be missing one of the pins at the back. And if I am, I'd love to know what the output from it's supposed to be, whether it's a duplicate or whether it's actually got something different going through. And then I can complete rebuilding my battery. Although you can't tell because we've got a lot of screen flicker, this is actually one of the nicest color screens I've seen on a handheld PC. Things are not quite as simple as I initially thought. Take a look at this. So after a little bit more messing about, I decided I'd see if there was a resistance between these two plates on the negative side because they appear to just run together. And that's when I noticed this tiny surface mounted component. And if we pop a light behind, there we go. You can see the thinner of the two pins actually gets its power from across that component. Now, initially I thought it was a resistor because if I 
set up my multimeter. You can see I'm getting a resistance. And that resistance appears to slowly creep up the longer that I keep it on, suggesting that this is in fact a small capacitor. So while we're measuring resistance, of course it applies a small voltage and that voltage is charging that capacitor. If we swap now to the voltage, there should be no voltage and yet there it is. And if we wait, it should drain the capacitor. And there we go. So I think this is a very small capacitor. I'm still puzzled as to why there's two connections on the positive side when they don't appear to be connected and there doesn't appear to be a matching pin. So far, it all looks pretty simple. I've effectively got two double A's separated by a thermal fuse with a split following a direct feed and a feed through what seems to be a capacitor and a perfectly ordinary negative feed. But if it's all that simple, why isn't it working? So this hasn't quite been the video I was hoping for. As you can see, I am a little bit stuck. I can't actually get it to run off the batteries. And I'm not sure if it's because I'm missing another component like the capacitor that we found, assuming it is a capacitor. And if you know otherwise, just pop a comment below. Or perhaps I'm missing something completely different. Maybe on the back there should be a fourth pin. Perhaps the unit's broken or damaged or something has gone inside. If anyone has any idea how I can fix this, please let me know. And then of course, I'll do a follow-up video. So while this isn't necessarily the video I intended, if you've enjoyed this video anyway, don't forget to give me a like and a sub. It would be much appreciated. I'm very close to 3000 subs, which is amazing considering how niche this channel actually is. And if you really enjoyed this video, you might consider becoming a member. Doing this will help fund new batteries, new accessories, and of course, new devices for the channel. Also, you'll get a cool badge like one of these, and there's a few more on the way. Talking of niche, part five of my OPL tutorial will be the next video to be released. So don't forget to hit that notification bell so you don't miss it. The tutorials are suitable for any of the Scion range. And if you don't own a Scion, OPL can be programmed on any of the Scion emulators out there. As always, my name's Hugh. This is Handheld Computing. Thanks for watching.